Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Yuki Kinoshida of Pluffle. Yuki, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Cameron. Of course. Well, I'd like to start out with your upbringing. Uh, where did you grow up, and what would you say your childhood was like? Yeah, so I was uh, born in Japan, but I grew up in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, uh, where I pretty much spent almost all my life until uh, college, uh, where I went to the University of British Columbia up in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, my childhood was, I spent a lot of time outdoors. I was always getting my hands dirty. I was always doing something, making something. Um, you know, I'd, I my parents didn't let me really spend too much time on, on, on the screen, on the computer, or like the, the TV. So yeah. as a result, yeah, I was just always outside, always playing, always running around, always getting injured. Um, yeah. Home um, yeah, and then kind of grew up very bilingual. Um, I went to a Japanese school during the weekends uh, and uh, went to a, obviously a regular school during the weeks. So very, very busy, kind of trying yeah. to manage both both languages and, and both learnings. Uh, uh, but yeah, overall had, <laughs> had a good childhood. Awesome. Yeah, growing up, I'm curious, did you have an entrepreneurial mindset or what were some of your aspirations at that time in your life, would you say? Yeah, so I was always looking for something to do. Um, I always got very bored quickly. So like I always had to keep my my mind occupied. And one of the things I, I did was I turned um, this pencil business into a side hustle when I was back in second grade. Uh, it was pretty <laughs> funny. So when you did well in school, uh, the teachers gave you like pencils from different like baseball teams. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't really have a much of an interest in baseball, but I knew that like different teams were worth like a different amount. Because whenever I got like a Red Sox pencil, everyone would be like, oh my God, you have a Red Sox pencil. Uh, <laughs> so I would be like, oh my God, I guess there's like a value to each of these pencils. Uh, so I ended up like starting like trading these pencils from like for more things uh, like soda or like candy or like sometimes even money. Yeah. Uh, and then I still even like started this operation with like a few of my friends uh, to like start selling these pencils uh, to like other people uh, and like making them collectibles. Eventually yeah. it got shut down um, because you're not allowed to resell things. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we were in second grade. <laughs> it was a memorable experience. I remember my parents were pretty upset because the the principal like gave us a talk about like how we shouldn't be, you know, like reselling things. That's like stealing from the school or whatever. But, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of like just a funny anecdote that I have from, from my childhood. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm curious, like the transition from Japan and then going into Canada, was what time period was this? Was it when you went to school? Is that when you moved? What, what was that like? Yeah, that's right. I went to college uh, up in Canada. Uh, yeah. You know, my parents are very international, you know, and my dad works at an international organization. So they were always pushing me to go abroad. Uh, but I wanted to stay close to America because I knew that's where I wanted to be and, and grow up. So yeah, uh, kind of like a middle ground was was Canada. Uh, I still got to get a little bit of that international experience, but uh, stay pretty close to close to Canada. So awesome! What did you end up studying at uh, British Columbia then, when you're with your time there? Yeah, I started. I studied like a mix between a business and a econ degree. Um, so yeah, it was it was pretty good. Uh, but I got a good sense of both worlds. Uh, even took an entrepreneurship class back in college. It wasn't very useful, I would say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got some got to meet some really great people. Uh, throughout the university awesome with your time there were you involved with any athletics or clubs uh would you say yeah definitely i was i was involved with 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 quite a few things at, you know, at university um mainly just like getting a feel of what i enjoy or why what, what i didn't like um i did a lot of like small like pro bono consulting gigs uh where i worked with a lot of like local nonprofits, but also startups yeah. as well um, one of the startups I remember was called Fatso. They're like a peanut butter based uh, CPG company. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a lot of work with them. Uh, and that's where I kind of first got my like exposure to what it's like to to work with or for a startup. Yeah. Uh, and I remember that experience a lot more fun than than any other course, anything else I was doing. So uh, I remember that was kind of like a like a starting point. To, okay, entrepreneurship seems seems pretty cool. Certainly. Uh, getting into or before we get into Pluffle, I know this is like a vital time for your founding story. I saw some of your like, resume and it's kind of based around what would you say that was based around? Where were you going towards before Pluffle and being a startup founder yourself? Yeah, definitely. I was probably, I was probably like going to go through the traditional like uh, corporate route um, yeah. as that kind of seemed to be like the default of what everyone was doing. And 
um, seemed to be like what, you know, my, my parents like would have been the most happiest if I had just gone through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so a lot of like consulting corporate related experience, uh, I was going to be working at like Accenture uh, out of New York at yeah. graduation. But yeah, as soon as I had the opportunity to, uh, to, to work on Puffle full time, which was kind of a dream of mine, um, I just took it and ran with it. Uh, and you know, told myself I would figure out how to how to like survive later. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to dive into that, which I know is like during your schooling time. This is when Pluffle was created, and it's really an issue that you and your co-founder faced at your university as well. If you don't mind, kind of share some of that story. What inspired the creation, and especially making it into like a a dog bed for humans? What what was the inspiration for that? Yeah, the the story actually comes from my my co-founder. Uh, he worked at a coffee shop uh, where there was a huge Great Dane. Uh, you know, Great Danes are big, big dogs. They're almost like the size of miniature horses. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, one of his jobs was uh, to take care of the dog. I was pretty old and kind of and had a lot of mobility issues and whatnot. And the owners were obsessed with the dog because, I mean, they named even a cool coffee shop after it. And mm-hmm. um, and they're just like really obsessive when it comes to over their, their, their like, pets. Uh, so, um, Noah, he took a lot of, spent a lot of time with it. And one thing he did was cuddle up, uh, in its dog bed with it as like, as a way to like, kind of like calm it down and just like <laughs> make it feel better. I don't know. The owners just wanted him to do it. So as well, he was spending a lot of time during school in this just gigantic dog bed, which is in the back of like this, this Tesla, uh, yeah. that they had, um, and just like, he was just sleeping in it. And he had this moment one day where he was just like, what if there was like a dog bed, but made for humans? Like I'm sleeping in this dog bed all the time and it's not very comfortable. Um, you know, it's not very soft. It's not very supportive. Um, it's just made for a dog. It's not made for, for humans. Yeah. Uh, so he was like, yeah. And he calls me. He's like, you can just have this, like the craziest idea. It's like, I'm like, well, dog beds, but for humans, I'm like, oh, surely that exists. Like surely there's no way that's an idea that that's not, that's not available already. So yeah. we both like, go on the internet and like look through google and like amazon and every single one of these platforms and to our surprise like it doesn't even exist and and what we find is actually a few people talking about how they wish there was bigger dog beds to begin with um so we're like okay well there's clearly like could be a market opportunity here uh maybe there's a good reason it doesn't exist but we feel like you know there's definitely something that we could make here if marketed properly i could definitely attract a lot of different interest groups so yeah. that's that's where it all kind of started. I love that. I, I would love to hear about kind of like the prototyping process. How did that come about, the research and development? And then where did you guys end up looking for sourcing eventually? Yeah, so prototyping was interesting. Kind of all we just knew was we wanted to make a dog bed, but bigger. Uh, yeah. And that's where we started off. So we bought a lot of like dog beds in the market markets see what we liked see what we didn't like see what shapes we wanted to incorporate and just brought them to like a local seamstress we found off craigslist it was just like here here's some fabric here's some foam uh make something for us and then she just stitched together this like pretty decent like first prototype which was not at all like something that could be mass manufactured but was like pretty comfortable and validated the idea that sleeping on a dog bed but bigger and like more made more comfortable is actually something that could be good yeah. Uh, especially like the aspects of like curling up and like, you know, be able to tuck your hands and feet underneath the, the bolster and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So we had all our friends try it. We got like feedback, you know, we had people at school try it. And uh, that was kind of like our very first prototype, which was actually really pivotal because after that first prototype, you know, we started like trying to source things on, online um, through like Alibaba, like trying to get things in Asia. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we didn't actually make too much progress. Uh, so our first prototype, kind of carried us forward all the way to the point where we marketed it and uh, went viral. Uh, wow. And then that's the point where we're like, okay, now we actually have a lot of people interested in our product. You know, a lot of people on our email wait list. Um, we should actually like get serious about trying to figure out how, how to manufacture this. So we kind of like went through a lot of co- like countries, like we were looking at Indonesia, India, China, like getting a bunch of manufacturers, getting a bunch of samples. And that's when we really like hit the burners on, okay, let's get like closer to, to what we want and developed a product that was more than just just a big dog bed but something that would be uh, really comfortable and something we'd actually enjoy sleeping in and, and, and having yeah for sure 
I'm curious, once you eventually started selling uh, D2C, what did like logistics and shipping and how does that look for a massive dog bed like that? What does it look yeah. like? Yeah. So the biggest part was kind of like the development process started after we had set, started selling, um, which is, you know, interesting. We, we had a Kickstarter, which, which helped, but, um, you know, people thought that the product was already ready. Uh, oftentimes that they do on Kickstarter, people don't always understand it, especially if they're coming outside of Kickstarter. So yeah, uh, we set our like sales an arbitrary deadline in like November to deliver. And by like August, which is when we had to start, we still were like not at a stage where we wanted to be. Um, but like somehow we had like figured it out just at like the deadline of like when we needed to ship the boat out to make our like promised or to make somewhere even close to our promised delivery date um, within like December. Mm -hmm. uh, of 2022 and we were able to ship out our very first production run and then it was pretty nerve-wracking because like you know with COVID uh the, the the boots and all that stuff was like a lot slower than usual but yeah uh, I think by the time we were shipping it was actually pretty fast so we got blessed with like everything just working out really smoothly um but yeah it was kind of like taking pre-orders for almost uh entire year like seven months up wow. all the way up to like December slash January uh, wow. And that was an interesting experience. Like, I, it was definitely, I think, I would regret anything. Um, yeah. You know, we we probably lost a lot of customers, uh, potential customers, because like, you know, we were we didn't have the product available for like Christmas and stuff. But we yeah. also like got customers we would have never had if we weren't taking pre-orders. So for sure, uh, it's a little stressful because people are always asking you like, "Where's my shipment?" Like, "Are you guys legit?" And we're like, in the behind the scenes, like working as fast as possible to get like the shipment yeah. out. But um, that's how we kind of like bootstrapped and like built our company before we had even had a single product out in the market, which I think let us move really fast and for sure just, uh, kind of like get, get ourselves out there. Yeah, for sure. I would love to hear kind of like now, how do you handle logistics? Do you, do you hold inventory? Do you have a 3PL? What does that look like for customers ordering today? Yeah, pretty standard, like kind of e-commerce CDC model. Uh, we have a 3PL, uh, we have like some inventory. We're out of stock right now. So we're actually yeah. trying to try to stock up um, again, but yeah, we have a we have a two manufacturers uh, in Asia. We're actually looking to expand um, our operations and look for new manufacturers as well. So that's why we actually my co-founder and I actually just spent a month in China, uh, or about three weeks in China. Wow. Uh, yeah, like a month ago. So really fresh off that trip, uh, got a lot of learnings from like exactly how our products made um, yeah. exactly why our product is priced the way like our costs are the way it is and yeah. like and nailed down every single line item uh to understand like where we could optimize and uh yeah so we're looking forward to kind of like getting our costs down but also developing new products um we're actually planning on launching a kickstarter uh, in in june or july for a awesome. new product that's coming up um can't say too much more than that but yeah uh yeah we're really excited about uh having a new product in the market awesome I'd love to go back to kind of like that launch time. And when you're collecting these emails, what was your marketing looking like? Were you doing any paid or was this all organic? You said you mentioned viral. What what was that like? Yeah, it was completely organic. I didn't even wow. know what like meta or like Facebook ads were it was at the time. Uh, all yeah. I knew was that TikTok was a platform that let like young people like us kind of go viral all the time. I guess you don't have to be young, but um you know so i didn't barely even knew what tiktok was too so we started studying the platform we downloaded it we we're asking we we're like literally asking all our friends like what does like this hashtag mean what does this mean uh <laughs> and we were just trying to figure out the platform so we started like hopping on some trends like making some videos and just getting our concept and idea out there and surprisingly we're already for the bat we're getting like you know a thousand plus views which is like something that we weren't getting like we you know, more expo organic exposure than like Instagram or any other platform that we were like so far like marketing on. So we're like doubling yeah. down on TikTok. And within like, I don't know, a week or two, one of our videos went super viral, um, had like, you know, 3 million views in a week. Now it has like nine or 10 million views, the classic like TikTok viral story. Yeah. And all we had was like some landing page that we had built on like Wix, uh, which yeah. is a website that's pretty bad like again not very functional but all it did was collect emails so with that landing page we were able to collect like 10,000 15,000 emails in a matter of like 24 hours after wow. so yeah that was just like a great funnel to a kickstarter campaign because now we had all these people like antsy like bugging us all the time whether we were going to make this product or not or whether we were going to launch um little did they know we had even 
like no idea even how to manufacture this thing at the time but yeah we we're like okay now we can like pivot and become like an official <laughs> company like this is how we start so I, that's awesome that's huge i'm curious uh kind of where do you see the the company going is it fully d to c do you see d to c from now on do you see it going into retail what would that look like expansion wise yeah, I think it's going to be DDC heavy. Um, yeah. We're looking to kind of expand into a little bit into retail. Um, the biggest thing, there's still like a lot of logistical challenges you have to figure out, like getting the box size smaller and, yeah. you know, all that. Um, and like kind of meeting everything for retail. It's kind of a whole different beast. So we're taking it slow in terms of retail, just because I know there's a lot of challenges that come with entering it. Uh, yeah. DDC has been great for us. We're going to, I think, continue to double down on it, expand it uh and and find different ways to sell i think yeah uh, we recently launched an amazon so we're experimenting slash exploring that channel uh seeing sort of how it does compared compared to just our shopify yeah. channel i'm um, looking to sort of launch new products uh have like a lower entry price point so that you know it's more people can buy buy a product from us yeah uh, as well as kind of like shift our marketing a little bit i think we're going to be doing a little bit of I don't, I don't know if rebranding is the right word. I, I don't think that's the right word, but more so just like, okay, now we have like, you know, eight months worth of customer data. Yeah. Uh, and now we're looking at it. We're, we're like, okay, well, customers are actually not really the TikTok demographic. So yeah. is our de demographic. It's okay. Okay. It's like moms with kids, you know, like 40 year old plus women uh, who want to, you know, either like get cozy themselves or, yeah. or, or like have kids that like absolutely love the product. So we're understanding that and uh you know looking to shift our marketing to kind of like suit that and tailor that a little bit more yeah. um which is something that we're not familiar with but something you know we're we're actively trying to figure out which i think is really important that like you don't stick with your original strategy like throughout because yeah things change and your demographics change and your expectations sure. might change based on data and what you see so absolutely I'm curious then, um, kind of the point you just mentioned, when you marketed and that TikTok, for example, went viral, what are you finding after you collected those emails, then the consumer who actually purchases at that point, what is that demographic, would you say, from your... Yeah, demographic? so it's interesting because, um, well, for one, what worked for us is TikTok is pretty heavily female, yeah. uh, but like our emails were like eight, 70 plus percent female, which is yeah. like interesting, even more female than the platform. Uh, I think that's just because the interest always has been sort of female oriented. And though I think that we could definitely convince guys to buy this um, for themselves, I think it's just, I don't know why it's just a little bit harder uh, yeah. for guys to kind of adopt like a new concept um, yeah. like this. Um, so it's always been heavily female. But what we noticed was, you know, females were collecting were, were young, right? It was like the TikTok demographic it was like 18 to 25, and heavily. But yeah. the people that actually bought were from the older tail end of from TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, which makes sense, I guess, because you know it's a little bit more expensive item. I uh, yeah. need disposable income, and sort of like the eighteen year olds on TikTok, uh, genuinely don't have uh, that much disposable income. So yeah, we found that yeah, just the older demographic from TikTok was buying. But just because of the sheer reach and the eyeballs that we were able to get through TikTok, um, that leveraged that got us like leverage and like press and like media. And like at this one point, even Jimmy Fallon was like talking about it. So uh, <laughs> like it still worked to get like eyeballs like everywhere else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that TikTok demographic necessarily isn't like the super converting mm. uh, demographic from, from what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, I know. I mean, just being an early launched, early stage startup, I'm curious. Um, I conclude each episode with this. If you can share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, Maybe something you've learned or regret along the way. What would you say that would be? Yeah, I think just especially just move fast uh, and worry about problem solving later, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the the biggest thing that worked for us, but the biggest thing that could also like really been been the downfall for us. So we took kind of took 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 the risk and it paid off. But at that time, if we did it like capture the hype from TikTok and like waited to officially launch our company and all that stuff. I think that a lot of it, the interest could have died down and maybe would have not have been as effective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we were able to really capture all the interest and maximize like the amount of like customers we were able to get at that point, even though we had no idea how to man manufacture the thing because we were just moving so fast and yeah. um, we didn't really care. We were just like two of us. We we're like, 
gonna launch this. I'm gonna get things moving. So I would say that's one thing that really worked worked well for us. For sure. Well, Yuki, thank thank you so much for joining me today. And to the listeners out there, make sure to check out Pluffle at wearepluffle.com.